Thank you, studio audience that is not here. Uh, welcome to the JHS Show Live. It's Wednesday, 3 p.m. Central Standard here in the Midwest. We have a real banger of a show for you. Now that we've clickbaited you here with the title, Bass Pedals Suck, I'm going to apologize. Bass pedals don't really suck. Top down uh, camera. Let's show, let's show everyone. We have a lot of bass pedals here. Uh, and pretty excited to go through this and have a co-host special guest, Roy. Roy is here. Um, yes. How you doing, man? Doing great, man. We're, uh, we've been having fun today yeah. going through all these pedals. Um, so let me give the introduction here. Uh, Roy, Roy Mitchell, one of my favorite bass players. So I didn't tell you this earlier. I think for me, it's Pino, Carol K, and you are my favorite. No pressure. <laughs> wow. No pressure at all. Um, huge fan uh, of your music. A lot of people watching are familiar with Mute Math, probably. And uh, we'll get into a lot of that. But yeah, you're here from Nashville. And um, multi-instrumentalist, producer, engineer. What You're just kind of, you're a musician. That's what you're doing. And yeah. So what's it what's it been like in 2020 it's been interesting uh just creating a lot from home you know in my studio since i uh left touring in 2017 i had to really uh just figure out what i was doing man because um you know the band mute math was such a live act you know we we're always on the road so even though it was kind of sad to see that part it was very essential for my just my well-being and for my family to get off the road and it it made me dive into uh, studio work and just and I was I had just moved back to Nashville I was in Miami before that and um, yeah up to 2020 thankfully in a way I was kind of in that groove already I wasn't out touring so I didn't feel you know that huge shift which a lot of the industry has felt you know unfortunately um, not only the musicians but I think about all the techs the people who are at the venues you know it's just it's been really crazy um yeah it's like a full wipeout of a live industry yeah it's um you know bus drivers you know semi driver everyone you know it's just so impacted by this obviously and uh i just feel really fortunate to have been already in the groove of of, of creating in the studio working on productions working on my own music working on my sample packs um and just kind of in my basement being at home and then you know, really focusing on my family when I'm not down there in my little man cave, as my wife yeah. calls it. We'll get into your sample packs. All that's super cool. We're going to give some stuff away. Yes. Yeah, we're going to give some stuff away. Um, yeah, I think we'll, we're will we going to roll roll our Skillshare ad. Let me introduce everyone who's on camera today. We have Nick, who is always the co-host with his golden microphone. Anything you want to say to the... The people you know, out there. just it's good to be here again yeah. with all of you people. <laughs> and then we have Addison. He is the official moderator. Yes, I yes. I think you're a moderator. Sure. You're going to handle the comments, yep. the suggestions, yep. some stuff like that. Some questions. And then we have another person in the room who never wants to be mentioned, and that's fine. So let's roll this ad. This makes shows like this possible. Believe it or not, there's expenses involved in doing things. So here's a Skillshare ad. Skillshare is an online community with thousands of inspiring classes for curious people at every skill level. Explore new skills, get better at the things you already love, get lost in creativity, and join the millions of other people that are already enjoying this platform. There's tons of stuff you can learn on Skillshare. Perhaps you're a really creative person. There are classes for you. Struggling to find resources on how to start your small business? Well, you guessed it. There are classes for that as well. I wish Skillshare had existed when I started JHS. I could have taken a web developing class and made my first website way better. It was bad. And maybe JHS would be as big as Boss or Electro Harmonics by now. Probably not, and that's okay. It's fine. But there are courses that teach you how to record better audio, how to edit video. You can take classes on graphic animation. So if you ever wondered how Nick does the fancy graphic stuff on our show, you could learn to do it yourself. Nick, if you're listening right now, there is a course called Learn How to Mix Music with Young Guru. Frankly, I want all of our jams from here on out to sound like Jay-Z albums. I don't think that's too much to ask. So go take the class, Nick. Maybe I'll take it too. 
There's even content on how to solder and classes on understanding electronics, which is super cool if you have any interest in building pedals or gear. The classes are put together really well. They're broken down in bite size and easy to understand pieces. In some classes, they even go so far as to provide shopping links for the supplies you're gonna need for that class. It's awesome, it's amazing, it's like college, but way cheaper and you don't have to get good grades to keep learning. That was always my problem. There's literally thousands of topics and the best part is that it's less than $10 a month with their annual subscription. That's like 33 cents a day, that's like a penny an hour, I don't know. I didn't really do the math because I'm bad at math, but maybe Skillshare has a math class I should take. I'll look into it. At the end of this stream, we'll be posting a link in the description. The first 1,000 people to use the link will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Don't go right now. Go in like 20, 30 minutes after the live's over. It'll be there, and you might really like it. That was a beautiful ad. What do you think, Nick? Was that? It was wonderful. It was very well placed. I should probably take that class. I don't think I've commented yeah, on it. Yeah, you haven't yet. really done anything I've yeah, ever I asked you to do. I'm That's sorry. Fine. I'm such a disappointment. Um, one more thing. The shirt. This is a new item in the store. Uh, Mr. Tambourine Man, a really amazing designer. You might have seen me wearing a Tube Screamer, TS9 kind of vibe of this. Anyways, MrTambourineMan.com. You can check it out in our merch store as well. It's nice. It's nice. What do you think of that, Roy? I it's like very, it. Yeah, it's cool. It's awesome. It's abstract yet very, very clear and fun. We have a lot to talk That's about and do. <laughs> kind of like bass pedals? <laughs> it's kind of, yes. Segway. Segway, mm -hmm. segway. All right, so so Mute Math. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, you have a huge fan base with Mute Math. There was a band before that, Earth Suit. Yes. Which kind of became Mute Math. Sort of. All so, <laughs> Sort of. <laughs> and then I even listened to some Pink Dust last night. Oh, yeah. I remembered Pink Dust. Yeah, yeah you've done a lot of work. Yep. So how did all of this start for you i think you yeah. get into stuff i remember we had a uh, uh an old podcast you were on it and uh i think you were like 12 13 14 years old and you get into music tell us how you end up being here today what's that road look like for you um yeah well, okay well to start off i guess my dad was the first huge mu musical influence for me he you know he's a 60s rocker basically you know he did like other styles, but, you know, jamming with him early on when I was, I think I started when I was six or seven, playing drums, learning guitar. What did this look like? Like in the basement? No. Um, so this was in McAllen, Texas, South Texas, right on the Texas-Mexican border. And he, he, he had kind of given up on music, I think, and just got a real job. He was a CPA. He had his own firm. And to really just like to de-stress and and when he came home uh in our living room we had a, a musical like a little area for music and he had his um gorgeous uh gibson 335 that he got back in the day in the 60s he had like a, kind of like it was a, a type of fender basement um amp but it was it was strange the it doesn't say fender on it it's um it was from a local store in houston that he bought it um I think it was it said Allen or something on it. Alamo? I don't know. I can't remember exactly. Um but anyway, it was kinda it like was a knock of doesn't matter. It was a it was a basement thing. And yeah, he just had a bunch of books, a bunch of records, and we just jam. And I and I would just be like around him all the time, like, how do you do that chord? What is this? How does this riff go? And he would say, Oh yeah, check out this drum part. Yeah, you know, it was just just amazing, you know. So you're and, a originally a drummer and guitarist. what was the and guitarist yeah. so what was the path to bass so um i guess those two worlds kind of like bass to me is perfectly in the middle of those two right and um so i always liked the bass was you know listening to the bass and i think the first opportunity i really got to play bass was for my high school production of greece Ooh. Uh, they needed a bass player, and it was basically all, you know, just... What's your favorite song? 50s, favorite Grease song? You know. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. It's pretty solid. And <laughs> Carol Kay probably played bass on that. Probably, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so it, I loved it, you know. We were yeah. in the pit playing, and 
and uh, and then I never had my own bass until I graduated uh, from high school and right as a graduation present my best friend at the time Tony Cepeda thank you Tony I haven't talked to him in a while thanks Tony he gave me um, the which uh, a 78p bass which is the neck portion of the space that I have here uh, we went through that story. Yeah. I don't know if we want to go through that story, but no, I ended it, up swapping it out and essentially this space, part of this when space. When I think of you, I think of this space and the PV. Yeah. The, ta the, the coffee table 180 yes. pound <laughs> base. Yeah. So that's the neck from the original. Yeah. Swapped it out with the body. Yeah. That's awesome. And um, anyway, so I had that base. I moved to New Orleans to go to uh, Loyola University, um, kind of seeking out at the same time the roots to the da my dad's side of the family who's originally from new orleans and i end up meeting paul and um he's playing downtown somewhere and um you know it's like yeah let's get to you know i could jam and he was like hey i, I need a bass like you know do you play or i was like yeah actually i have a bass you know bring it and um just started Plan music together. Such a good story. <laughs> that feels like Nick. That could be like a, like an ABC or like a Hallmark movie. Dude, let's shoot straight for Netflix original. Yeah, Seer I mean Netflix original series. The drummer guitarist ends up in New Orleans, going to university, meets a guy who needs a bass player, and he happens to have the bass, but he hasn't yet committed to the bass. Exactly. And there's this moment, and it's moving, emotional. <laughs> So that Absolutely. starts a wild road for you. It That's does. That's why you're setting here. So yeah. like around, that was 17, I was 18 maybe at that time. At that time. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and I just dove in after that. Like not long after that, I quit college and um, just started playing and practicing all the time. So what's the official start of Mute Math? Um, for me, it was 2005. I think... Paul and Darren started probably in 2003, maybe. They started working kind of as a production team, doing yeah. stuff for different people. And um, and they had another band called Macro Sick um, with some, some other guys, um, friends. I've never heard of that. Yeah, awesome. so um, that kind of morphed into Mute Math. And uh, as Mute Math started playing out and kind of, you know, getting the idea that this was going to be a band. Um, I was out of music in a sense, as far as a long-term career at that point. I, I had moved back to Texas, and I was planning on uh, going to law school, which I I did. I, I went to... Um, you could have literally been a <laughs> blues lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, law, I, law by day, blues by night. I... Um, I did one semester of law school, um, was really unhappy, and um, Paul called me. He's like, hey, we're looking for the fourth guy. We really need a bass player, and I had just gotten married, and I was like, all right, it's time to quit school again. Wow. And just really go for it, and um, that was really, that was at two in 2005 where it started. That's an awesome story. Here's some photos of you through the years. You want to you wanna narrate what's going on here? Any guesses? I just pulled these up. That Google. looks like one of the most, uh, probably one of the last tours I did. Vitals. Yeah, coming. which was a great time. I got to say, you know, that was, we, we had a really, really good run and uh feel really fortunate to, to have been in this band. And as usual, the slideshow needs to be manually moved. That's fine. Here we go. This is Odd Soul time. We were doing, Greg had left the van, unfortunately, at that time. And Greg was just a master of, I mean, just par creating parts and tone. And so I learned good. so much from him. Uh, great guy. And um, yeah, he, he left. So at this point, we were kind of in a, we weren't sure what we were going to do. I remember feeling this like this limbo. And because I guess I had played guitar and, and also, you know, Paul and Darren also play. They're, they're multi-instrumentalists as well. Paul plays bass and guitar. And um, we just kind of all tackled it together. Yeah. Um, let's check this out. I can't tell which one's you because of this amazing it, cover, but did, yeah, this yeah. is the record for me that was just so awesome. Just such a breath of fresh air when it came out. 
Um, I lived in Jackson, Mississippi. You guys played a small, uh, it's like a restaurant, <laughs> Howl, Howl and Howl Mouse. Mouse yeah. yeah, yeah. And the live show, I think the reputation for Mute Math was, you never knew if Paul was going to, you know, swan dive off the roads or, it was just, uh, and Darren, you know, he, a guy, you know, duct taping headphones to his head and just the energy was so amazing. Yeah. That's one thing, you know, I miss, like, I, th- I think Addison a- asked me before, do I miss the road and being on the road? And I think the, in the, sh- in the short answer is no, to be honest. Like, I just don't miss being on the road, being away from my family as much as I, I was for the last, you know, with Mute Math, 12 years. And then before that, I was on the road as well. So yeah. since 96, I think I did my first tour. This um, is from that podcast we did. And... Uh, what was I saying? Um, I was just talking about live. Yeah, yeah live, so not missing yeah, it. yeah, and the thing that I do miss, though, sorry, the thing I That's do funny. miss the most is the chemistry of working with the same people all the time and the chemistry that we had. You know, the energy that was there live was just, you could just feel it. And I mean, I remember, you know, you, we did this show in um, Mumbai, India, and we were just so jet lagged. I mean, <laughs> I almost missed the show. I, we we, it was a really long, awkward sound check, um, and we went. We had enough time to get back to the hotel, kind of change, freshen up, and I almost fell asleep. <laughs> like I I, I was sca- I woke up with that fright. Like, oh my gosh, what time is it? It's a horrible. A- feeling. And it was it was a horrible feeling. It definitely was. And I think it was a few minutes before I had to be down in the lobby. And um, anyway made it down there we were like literally nodding off i want to say right before we got on stage but the energy like just you had that energy to just boost you that adrenaline and obviously the crowd was amazing but i don't know i just missed that if you had to sum up playing in the rhythm section with darren what does that feel like i mean to me that's just uh, it's crazy um (laughs) i remember we were on the road in england and we had this guy on the i forgot his name um, he was a temporary kind of tech with us. And he goes, yeah, you guys, your, ryth- your rhythm section's kind of like water going down the toilet really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's the strangest analogy, but it's kind of cool <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. It, it, I know what he meant. It felt like it's just like this rush or this strange yeah. like we, flow going. We were, you know? ta- we were looking through records and we were talking and I th- the thing about the mute math sound is it it's the only thing i've ever heard other than like there's moments in like a rage against machine record they're they're different though it's a different thing mute math feels very much like when you go to a mute math show i remember thinking like this is probably what cream or the experience felt like of course it's a different there's different elements but that rhythm section is just it's like it's the band it's like the make or break of how that feels and paul floating over it it's just a a really cool uh, thing that you guys built yeah really awesome huge compliment (laughs) there's your uh, coffee table base yes which is um it's actually not mine i do not (laughs) own it i don't have my own t40 it was paul's dad's um and it's the base that you know paul had growing up and when we when we recorded um, Odd Soul, it was, you know, I was telling you, it was like we were kind of reaching back to the roots of the jam sessions that we had with our dad. Yeah. And and we had some gear. Like I used my dad's 335. We had, uh, Paul had um, his aunt lend us a, a Princeton and a, a, a telly that she had okay. and obviously a T40. It was just, yeah, it's weird. I should get one, you know. Yeah, but. <laughs> I have one other photo of you. Uh, this is you in 1949. <laughs> you played for the Cincinnati Reds. True, this yeah. is Roy Mitchell. Tell us about <laughs> <laughs> It's a horrible, horrible <laughs> joke, but it pl- it played well, right? Did it play well? It was very it played, yeah, it played well. well yeah. Okay, it played well. <laughs> so um, I think we get down to get down to business here. Yeah. Uh, if we look down at this table. We're here because we baited everyone in and said bass pedals suck. Now, let's define where we're going here. This is going to be fun. And we don't really, you know, we're exploring. We have had a conversation. And for uh, a couple years, the last year, a lot, we have people 
constantly asking us about pedals for bass. Can I use this on bass? Can I do this on bass? Can mm -hmm. I do this? And I thought, I got to get Roy in here and let's talk about your rigs because you were like elemental uh, in this moment. For me, I'm not a bass player. I, I have faked it on some tracks and stuff, you know, but I'm not a bass player. I remember coming to a show after we had met and you guys, like Todd, I'd met Todd. He'd filled in on guitar and had become the new member. Mm -hmm. I came to some sound checks and I walked up to your board and I believe it's this board. We're still speculating the year, but if you see the top left, you have the crazy old unpainted ABY. Nick will remember those. Oh, yeah. And then you have a stamped Morning Glory with the bad stamp, the one that's like not separated. And that was... Uh, that was super that interesting thing. because I was just making pedals and surviving and building a company, and that was the guitar pedal. That was the pedal I made for me to play my single coils through basements, and it just felt right to me, and that's all I cared about. And I walk up, and I'm like, this like, bass player I love is using it on his bass. So talk. <laughs> let's, let's start there. Um, okay. Well, first, did you – Yeah. I think I played – is that the four wheeler? The four wheeler is right here. Right here, right. Okay. Oh, the four wheeler. You the had, four wheeler. I thought it was blue initially. This is the low drive. Oh, maybe it was the low drive that I that yeah. I remember that yep. you sent me, and I was like, okay, this is supposed to be the bass. Which is this similar to the Morning Glory? No. And no. here's the humor. This pedal was the bass overdrive yeah. that I set, figured out nobody would buy it. Guitar players loved it. Yeah. So I just rebranded it as the Moonshine, and now oh, everybody loves it. Got it. Okay. I so I just said it was a guitar pedal, and it sold. How funny! There's like this that, reverse. That's a big part of what we're talking. We've been talking about throughout the day too. Yeah, I changed just, one minute thing on the toggle, left it alone, and just I remember like Tyler Burkham was obsessed with it, used it on a bunch of recordings and some other people. And I was like, I'm just gonna rebrand it. Why is it not selling? It's because we're calling it a bass pedal. Nobody wants it. Hmm. And Josh. Then I, Clarify what pedal is it now? It's the uh, low, uh, the moonshine. But the low drive became the, the moonshine. The low drive, yeah. Dead. Okay. If you look top down there, yep. it became. Yeah. That helps. I don't know if it's. Yeah, this is. So I remember, I remember getting this, trying it out, and I, I just didn't like it. It didn't work. See, the bass. bass players didn't even like the bass pedals. And, um, for, you know, I never had any kind of block of. Oh, this is a guitar pedal. It's only for guitar. Like, n yeah. it just never occurred to me. And that's where we need to talk so, here. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, which is obviously a myth, you know, that you have bass. I mean, uh, the term bass pedal is, I don't know. It just doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't really yeah. exist in a way. Like, I think all these can be used for any instrument, however you want to be creative with it. And I don't even know, to be honest, why I gravitated towards this. Maybe I just was trying everything out um, on my bass, and it just it felt right. It sounded right. It was subtle enough, but then I could kind of, you know, do you know, just turn turn up the distortion a little bit, the overdrive on it, and just like it was just it did exactly what I wanted. So one thing in hindsight about this pedal, and oh, I'll just yeah, real yeah, quick, yeah, you go, go. Um, so, and the reason why I needed a pedal like this was because before I was really getting any kind of drive from the actual amp that I was using live, and it just wasn't satisfying enough for me. Like, whether it was an SVT that I, I had for a while, and then I moved over to um, a Mesa Boogie a 400 Plus, which is a great bass amp, but like, it, I just couldn't get anything to break up the way I wanted. So I was like, I need some kind of good drive. And I didn't necessarily want a big muff, which was what I was using. That's over the top. Before. Yeah. So it was just perfect. Anyway, I just want to throw that in there. So when when I put the Morning Glory out, I had taken a Bluesbreaker pedal. It's an old Marshall pedal. And I modded it to do some things. And I when I created the Morning Glory, in all honesty, I didn't really know how the circuit worked. You didn't have to. I, I was hearing and I designed with my ears. Mm -hmm. um, and now I know how the circuit works. And I think one thing that's very ironic is it has a low end roll off. And this is complicated because I constantly hear bass players talk about it kills the low end. Now mm -hmm. I understand that. I really do understand that. And, and that's why parallels are really nice. And what is it doing? You think is it, 
it, what is that low end cut on some pedals actually benefiting a bass guitar player? Can you talk about that for a moment? Like in a mix as a musician with a band, what's happening there? Because a lot of pedals that I know a lot of bass players love actually do have a bit of a high pass. Like they're it, trimming off. Yeah, it's probably bringing more clarity to their playing. Yeah. Simple as that. And and a lot of the times, you know, we talk, I talked about using, I have it here kind of set up, just having an EQ at the end where I would just boost things back up that would be killed by yeah. a distortion or something. Um, that solved the problem, I guess maybe uh, on stage sometimes, like, cause you know, it, d depending on the gig, if I would go DI and an amp, or I would just go straight DI, um, or I would do a clean signal mix with a chain of, of stuff. Um, I was always working with my front of house guy to ask him, is there enough flow in, or are you compensating on that? Or because for me on stage, I didn't really miss it. I, 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 I needed more of the clarity of what I was playing you know yeah um so it i just find it an interesting yeah opposition to a certain mentality yeah and, I, and i'm learning that for myself I, th I just think it's ironic that there's um there's a lot of information that tells us how something should sound to be good and for a guitar player i'm not a bass player i'll speak to guitar players the analogy is if I take a guitar pedal home, I'm sitting in my room with my clean amp and my guitar, and it sounds huge, it probably sounds horrible on a stage. Yeah. And that's been a real dilemma for demoing gear. I actually kind of despise demoing gear, but mm -hmm. I don't despise it. I don't, you know, we demo gear. It's just hard when people rely on that moment of watching a person demo, but it's not really how you use the guitar. You put all the low end. If your guitar is like fat and monstrous and you add it into the mix, oh my, it's nasty. Yeah. It's it's not going to sound good. So it's almost like this weird pre-mastering effect the Morning Glory has <laughs> on your bass in some way, I guess. Yeah, um, and, 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 and then down the road, I started using it in conjunction with the color box. And to me, it was just a match made in heaven. It was just so like, it's just, you know, I don't know. It just did something special, yeah. those two pedals together so we're um, gonna let's jump into this and jam but before i'm gonna do a slight history thing yeah because we we try to focus on the history here right nick i yeah. mean yeah we got to educate educate people we're trying to we're trying to educate nick i just want to say that's possibly the best singer you've ever made thanks it was just really two chords good. yeah it's two chords one more time did you use a bass effect on that no, I, I rolled all the low end off of my synths. <laughs> all right, so bass effects. I'm going to yeah. start there. This will be brief. I think the there's a really great irony in education here. The very first guitar effect ever was the Maestro Fuzz Tone. So 1962, I've showed this 100 times. And it came from an accident um, while Marty Robbins was recording Don't Worry in Nashville. So go listen to this later. We ran a test and got flagged, so we're not going to play it. But that's Marty Robbins. And in this song, the transformer in the mixer desk fails, and he's playing a six-string tic-tac bass, bass six kind of thing. And it's fuzzy and distorted. Half the people hate it. Half the people love it. They leave it in. The song goes to number one. And what happens when you can't get the sound that your friend's getting across town? You want to figure out, how do I do the bass, the thing with the bass? So the engineer, Glenn Snotty, creates a circuit out in a shed, duplicates it, and Gibson makes this pedal. So there's this irony that the first ever, it's like a bass track. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's fitting for today. And then another huge moment uh, is this. This is the first time a uh, bass guitar is ever recorded with distortion or fuzz in this way. Paul McCartney on Rubber Soul. The track is uh, think, uh, think, for think For Yourself. Yeah, and you mentioned, you were talking about this record. We were talking about it's this tone veneer. If you're going to hold yeah. that up. He would have played a proto, probably a proto, or it could have been the Woodbox version of this. But yeah, that was first recorded. And then we have uh, the Rolling Stones. That was 65, so 60... 1960, the Marty Robbins session. 
Then we go a whole uh, five years till someone's brave enough to track bass that aggressively in that way on the mainstream. That's Paul McCartney. And then uh, we have that's 65. 66 is under my thumb, Rolling Stones. It's the second time. And there's blurry lines. People were doing stuff, but those are huge records. And then we get into bass specific pedals. I think this, according, and I'd love for some conversation in the comments. Um, I actually want to track this down in more detail. I, you know, I think about it a little bit. I think this is the first bass specific pedal made. This is probably an Oberheim designed maestro, the the synthesizer guy, Tom Oberheim. Mm -hmm. He made this line of pedals, oh. and they they slapped the maestro name. And then we have um, this is going to be wildly out of timeline. It's fine. <laughs> We'll just flip through some of this. This is wild, the bass grunge. This is interesting. We'll get to this later, the 506. So I'm just going to show some bass pedals. This was a big moment um, because Boss never had any bass pedals. And in 1987, they dropped three or four here. So until 19, like, this is a real point to drive home. Until 1987, Boss ignored making bass pedals. That's a pretty huge evidence of like how many of our favorite songs hit songs bass players bass tracks used you know it, it's why did they do that and i think as a pedal manufacturer you have to you as a manufacturer of anything they just put out a new iphone do we need a new iphone i don't know it's you have to keep making things so mm -hmm. i think there's an element to in the 80s we end up with a lot of these bass specific pedals ibanez in the 90s Maybe it's to sell some other things. This is 1979. This is actually pretty early. It's one of the first bass pedals ever. Uh, this is a classic. Um, this is Nick's favorite. Yeah, it looks like it. the the branding of the box, it looks like something you would buy at Lowe's. Yeah. Like to hang, like it has like, it, it's like one of those packs that comes with like a drill and a hammer and then like wall mounts to hang a picture or something <laughs> the bass trio pedal chain overdrive limiter enhancer chorus pedals for bass guitar includes cable set three individual stomp boxes here's the here's the kicker thousands of unique tone combinations is, do we do we <laughs> think that's mathematically correct <laughs> that's i don't know uh then we have you know and then there's this guy we're gonna land here this is the Electroharmonics Baseballs, the most ridiculous My name favorite. ever. Uh, this is late 70s. I, It's probably the sec... I don't know. This is a blurry line. So if you're out there, you know that I'm a super nerd and I want to I wanna build these timelines out of effects history. So it'd be great for some bass players to chime in. What were the first bass effects you ever saw? Stuff like that. Uh, I, I think we're at a point right now where people probably want to hear some music. Let's do it. Do yeah. we want to demonstrate the baseballs? <laughs> yes. I think so. It's my favorite, you know, bass pedal out there. No, I, I, I remember it, and um, I don't know. I think I, I never bought it just because it's called baseballs. <laughs> <laughs> I hate That's saying so it. I just hate saying it. It's like very classic EHX. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, electroharmonics and the names. But here's the thing. You can't not remember that. <laughs> right, right. It's right. branding 101. Yeah. It's fantastic. Hey, while y'all are getting ready, just want to let the stream folks, watchers know, we've got a giveaway coming at the end here. We're going to give yeah. away some of Roy's uh, sample packs. So just stay tuned. Details and to possibly come. a Dodge Stratus. What? We may <laughs> I really... <laughs> <laughs> Stepping up the giveaway there. Sorry, I had to open All right, up my it's fine. Croix. That's a sound effect. So yeah, talk us through what we're gonna hear here. Tell everyone we're gonna try to keep these tracks bass heavy because it's all about the bass players today. Uh, yeah, I just set up. Um, I guess something similar to what I would use. I'm using this P bass, 78 P bass, and I got um, right now with this sound, the Morning Glory, going into <laughs> the bass balls. <laughs> Um, into uh, a EQ pedal, a Boss EQ, and at the end is the color box. Uh, pretty flat, so some of the, the low end that I would have lost from these two, I'll play for a second here. So here here's the Morning Glory by itself, or maybe I should start So this clean. is direct in, no amp. Yeah, direct in, there it is. Here's the Morning Glory. 
here's the morning glory with the EQ. This is That's such nice. a simple answer. Yeah. It is. We talked on the phone the other day. I, before we before we jam, I need to mention this phone conversation because this was such a light bulb moment. We we called you and we were like, "Hey, like what's with like guitar pedals?" and you're like, "Well, I just put an EQ on it to add more bass." <laughs> and it seemed like the simplest it thing. It felt too simple. Nick like, and I at, lost our minds. Yeah, we both just started laughing because it was like, "Oh, well, Duh. This Which is explains it's just, in the sixties when experience or cream they're tracking with fuzz phases, they just turn the bass up on the desk. Yeah. It, I feel so dumb. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's such a simple solution. And I love I mean the EQ this EQ pedal in particular I, I have and I use I've I've used a few others over the years. It's just I think every guitar player, bass player should have one. I'm they're, I'm they're convinced so useful. The ten most useful pedals ever made is the G the G seven. I mean, I can't tell you how many pro whatever that means, pro rigs have that in it. Yeah, for guitar as well. Yeah. Just I mean, yeah. just boosting to cutting things, it's like a new guitar, it's a new sound <laughs> just for one little move here. Yeah, it's like you can go change pickups. Yeah. That's cool, but you could possibly just bump a fader and be like, Oh, cool. There you go. Yeah. It's <laughs> Yeah, it feels like it feels like buying a new toaster. Like it's kind of boring, but you're like, oh, this is. Way, you obviously this haven't shot for toasters lately. Well, you know what I mean. They're super, <laughs> to- super fancy toasters. Okay. All right. So and then at the end, I have the the baseballs to kind of just just to add a little something. So here, here's the the sound by itself. That classic. So that pedal, what is it doing? Describe it to us. Um, it's an envelope, right? Yeah, filtering. It's almost like an envelope EQ filter. It has some dirt. Yeah, you could take that off. I put it on. That really cuts out the low, so I left that on. And I guess the sensitivity and how how much I'm attacking it as well is really okay. what I hear. It starts to bring out that high end, which I don't like as much, so I back that down. But it, it really, it's really responsive, and that's what I like about most of the pedals I own that I, I look for. And you know, that's probably what I heard in the uh, in the Morning Glory, that it it just felt right with the way I play, how hard I was tacking, the style I was doing. Like it just it just had this life of its own, you know? Yeah. All right. I think we should jam now. This is called B jam equals baseballs. <laughs> yes.
I think that was a hit record right there. <laughs> Thanks that was saucy. The audience. The audience really loves it. Hitting. I gotta say, I'm a fan of the baseballs. <laughs> Me too. It, I love the P-Base. It gives it like an a, an attack. Like it yeah. feels like if it was in a mix and like the bass was pulled back just a little bit, like you might not even know it was on, but it it might be one of those that secret sauce to kind of bring it up in the the mix a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I remember not liking it, like besides the name, but back <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> I was like, I don't know. It just it's just like this one trick pony and. I'm not gonna buy this thing just for that. And then like, I don't know. Today I I heard and we started messing around with it. I was like, oh man, it's good. <laughs> it's, a cool pedal. it's really good. That was a fun jam. That was fun. I feel revitalized. You know, it's been a long Same. week. Baseball jam and B really brought me around. Love it. What do we do next? Let's let's home run. I think we just keep rolling through here. Um, so we yeah. have a plethora of pedals on the table yeah uh, uh i, I could yeah. talk a little Go bit ahead. about the the big muff and yeah and how i used it um i remember yeah right uh, i want to say yeah it was it was early mute math still kind of with that dilemma before i got the morning glory of wanting to really grind up stuff and the heavy parts of like you know for example on um on uh chaos <laughs> Right, the verse part, and then when it hits on the chorus, I really wanted something that I could like get. Really like drive it, and at the time, um, the thing I had was this, and um, where did it, you you remember where you purchased it? Well. You know, let me back up. I had my story a little bit wrong. I had one of these early on and I lost it. And then I remembered liking it. And so I bought it again thinking this is going to be the right thing. And I remember going to the store and like shooting out different things. And this one had the the least amount of low end cut. So that's what I went. Well, that's what so I went this, for. This is expounding on the mystery. You wanted more low end at this point. Um, yes, I did. And this is before I got the EQ pedal. So, yeah. um, yeah, I remember, I remember liking it, liking the aggression and like the, the feeling that it gave, but then it became too, I don't know what the word is, like too much, too squished, too like muffled, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps. <Good one. laughs> is there a sound bite for that? Uh. Okay. Anyway. So today, when we were jamming earlier, I, I was really drawn to this, this pedal, which I don't know anything about really. The color, sound, bass, bass fuzz. You were telling me they're yeah. basically a tone bender, it's or no? A, it's a, it's a big muff. Yeah. So color sound the, is the uh, tone bender. In the late seventies, they in seventy three, seventy four, they do the Mark three, Mark four. That's irrelevant. But the next thing, a version five is a four transistor fuzz. They abandon the classic thing. It's a big muff circuit. So when you see <laughs> when you see jumbo super tone benders, jumbo tone benders, the yeah. bass one, it's a big muff. Got it. I mean, yeah, it is a big muff. This one was a lot of fun right now. Yeah. Play, playing let's, let's playing today, I should say, earlier today. So I'll have to switch some things out here. That's fine. While you're switching things out, Roy, I just want to tell you <coughs> two things that people have said about you. Number one, when you slide, the world smiles. <laughs> <laughs> that was said. And number two, you're second only to Pino Palladino, which hopefully you take that as a compliment. Oh, man, that's insane. You, would... Just to be in the same sentence with him. I mean, I really but... did mean it. I'm, I'm, I, I love the playing. I love your playing. Oh, I, you. I think there is this fine lot with any musician. And Darren, Darren's this way. Like, a lot of time busy playing and busy genres can be so exhausting mm. but there's something really musical about how you approach that and when you hear someone so versatile i think that's the thing about pino as well is you know he goes from seal to like i mean it, it just plays d'angelo d'angelo john mayer trio yeah. yeah and and that ability to pretty much play anything and it's not that it's like it's not that he's taking over a song, but if you remove him, it kind of falls apart. I think that's what's so great about the style that you guys developed in Mute Math. It's very similar. 
Can we? Can, do you want to talk at all about? Um, you mentioned his bass rig, like the pedal yeah, rig so, that he had. Yeah, I was I was at a mayor rehearsal and I walked up. I had to say hi. It's Pino, and I looked down, snark tuner, <laughs> just like normal patch cables, like things just thrown on a little board, snark tuner into a Boss OC, and like a Sans amp. That's it. It's Pino Balladino. And that was it. I mean, he has his SVT. And he has basically the same bass you're playing there. Which, yeah, to me, I think goes back to the point of, like, all of this, where it ultimately starts with the musician, with you. Yeah, we were talking about that. You yeah. can't go into gear and buying gear or whatever pedal thinking that it's going to make you a better musician. It's just it's not going to yeah. happen. I think people have this dream in their head that that's what's going to happen yeah. it might it might help you achieve a certain tone obviously or maybe I think it can inspire, inspire. yeah yeah absolutely it definitely does even just like you know any any guitar it's like it has a song in it you know you've heard mm -hmm. that people just yeah. pick up the song and i immediately i mean pick up this guitar and i immediately wrote this song you know um which which happens with pedals but i feel like people need to focus on it's the player you know we're talking about darren coming here if he played nick's uh set right now it would sound like Darren. yeah you know yeah i feel like i could go hand you any bass in the room and plug you into a behringer direct box and it's it's still you yeah, yeah you might be missing the something but that is so important to know it's that way with guitar i'm the reverse and i've shared this a lot i pick up any piece of gear it's not the reverse it's a I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I can pick up, you can have any pedal in here. I will make it sound within a 10% of basically what I want distortion to sound. I'll find where the knob, a rat, a DS1, a two, I'll find the thing. I turned every pedal into the same. I have like one sound. <laughs> like I, I just admitted it. I, right. Is yeah, it, no, yeah. totally. Yeah. No. I, I just, that's what I do. I, I love that. Cause I think like, yeah, it's very easy to get hung up on the gadget, the yeah. gadgetry and whatnot and yeah. it's like you know we're like when we were talking about this earlier we're it's like f focus more about being you than than the stuff that you have and no matter what you pick up you know no matter how much low end that pedal cuts off your bass tone you're gonna sound like you you know yeah absolutely what's our next jam here oh we um, have the bass fuzz yeah let's see if i got a sound going here yeah All right, so this is the bass fuzz. I'm just gonna leave the morning glory, morning, morning glory on. There's with the EQ. I'm gonna boost it a little bit here. Some low, uh, low end.
First time I've used nice. a wah pedal in four years. You guys are a lot of fun. I love love it. Love it. This thing's gnarly, man. <laughs> oh, it's brutal. But it's great. It's good. It's, it's good. It's good, kind of brutal. It's good and nasty. Uh, so we have that. Left the Morning Glory on. Again, yeah, yeah. This is straight DI bass tone through the color box. Yeah. So you mm. talk about your amp setup, DI. I know the last tour you guys were full in ears and pretty yeah yeah so how, how has that changed over the years um it's morphed like I, I guess for more than half of it i always had an amp on stage which was usually um some kind of svt with the, the a10 cab um and then you know I, I had the 412 uh cab system with um the mesa boogie 400 plus which is which was a lot of fun. Um, very different kind of sensation, I guess, on stage. I felt, I think once we moved away from smaller clubs where like the PA and the, you know, we were, this was before we, we went to in-ears. Um, so we're relying on a lot of monitors. Feeling the bass was way more important in the smaller gig setting. Um, Have you ever tried the butt kicker devices? No, I haven't. <laughs> I think someone came and, and let Darren try it out, yeah. and it was just too weird. Uh, one caught on fire under a drummer I knew, like really? smoke. Uh, you know, fire is a a visual that didn't really happen. It, it was smoking, and <laughs> anyway, um, I, was, I was curious if you'd ever used one. Yeah, no, I did have um, a friend of mine try to sell me on like a plate, some kind of plate that is like part of the stage that vibrates. Hmm. Um, I guess it's kind of a similar concept, but you're standing on something, so you kind of feel, you know, mm. the 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 low end. Anyway, that became, in my opinion, uh, an experience that that became less important as we moved to in ears because I felt like I was hearing everything more clearly, and I could feel enough from the amp and and from the PA when we we're moving to to bigger venues. Um, so I guess the amps got pushed aside a little yeah. bit and, you know, we didn't, there was a point where, um, well for odd soul, for odd soul, what happened was I did have the, the Mesa boogie amp, but that record we used a lot of, um, and even records before that, we actually used very little bass amps to track. So we, I had this, um, Fender, I still have it, this Fender um, concert amp. I think it's from the mid 80s. Um, and it sounds great on bass. Um, so I took that out. Um, I remember that. Do you remember I remember that? seeing that and thinking how weird that was. And um, so I used that. And because really the tone was coming, a lot of the tone was coming from that, I believe, uh, or helping it. Um, and yeah, as as the years went on, I don't know, I just felt like. We moved in more, if depending on the style. Odd Soul was more vintagey, like riff rock <laughs> uh, thing. <laughs> uh, we had talked about that before. Um, and in the comments, just as an experiment, list two bands that you feel define riff rock. I'm really curious. We were talking about. I don't know what other word to use for like this Odd Soul vibe. Yeah, but it doesn't feel like riff. You know. Yeah, We're gonna it's, get it's it touches on that, yeah, you know, yeah. um, you know, and Paul had the, the, the Oregon out. I mean, we were, we had all our gear, all the amps, everything really just going full, all out, you know, kind of a vintagey and old school vibe on that. Um, but then the next record vitals was a lot more electronic and synth bass. So, um, it was just, it didn't, it was wildly different. It was yeah. very different. Yeah. We probably lost a lot of people and we probably gained others, you know? So, uh, but we loved changing it up. I mean, we were just all over the place with the yeah. different genres we liked and influences. So it kept us, you know, how happy. How does it change, you know, because when you go from, you know, like I think Odd Soul is a very like band sounding album still, you know, when you start adding like a lot of synth layers, um, how does that, does that change the way that you approach the way you dial in your bass tones when you have pads that are big and are filling out space as well uh not no not necessarily on on that record though um i was actually playing more guitar live because a lot of the bass sounds were coming from synth bass and todd was playing that live 
So I switched to this very kind of clean guitar, um, you know, and a lot of it ended up being direct with um, one of those Palmer DIs. Yeah. We yeah. use those a lot. Anytime we went direct, at least one of those was in the mix. So that yeah. helped. It wasn't like a straight, you know, yeah. um, direct sound. But um, yeah, to answer your question, so like the, the bass synth stuff was going on right. um, and sometimes I would play along to it. Like um, there's a song on the first album called um, Picture and it ha it's very synth bass, like synth bass heavy. And I just played the exact same part with okay. with that and just I, I i would think of it more like whatever space that synth bass um was taking i would just stack on top and try to not like i just try to make it better not muddy it up so a lot of right. times what that meant was just probably a little more mid-range sound mm -hmm. more like a punch sound like just and some maybe grind and rock in it where that that sub and synth bass thing was happening underneath me and just yeah. trying to be one with the synth bass. Right, right, right. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, uh, yeah that's okay. a great question. Yeah, I've always wondered, like, in bands that have a lot of synth heavy stuff, if there's ever issue with just, like, competing, you know, because sometimes. Yeah, I wouldn't, I never thought of it that way. I just yeah. thought of it as, like, you know, and sometimes we'd have to have that on the track. So um, we would, you know, I, I looked at it kind of as another member and just you're carving the EQ again, how right, important right. that is. Um, around those sounds to really find what your what your place is. Same yeah. with the kick drum. I right, think a lot right. of bass the bass players are probably intuitive about that. Just kind of depending on what the drummer likes and what his sound is. Unfortunately, I think for Darren and I, we didn't really ever talk about it. It just we just you know did it and had that chemistry and it just mm -hmm. his sound, you know, just kind of we meshed together nicely. So yeah, let's go to That's the really next. Cool potent pedal pairing okay. of bass tone here. Do you guys want to hear some uh, of the fans riff rock ideas while you're Yeah, it yeah, out? I mean, this is a little bit of a mystery how this is defined through the years. We've got Black Sabbath, we've got Led Zeppelin, yes. Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, someone said Hanson, I think that was a joke. <laughs> the Doors, ACDC, Queens of the Stone Age, Stone Temple Pilots, um, The Stones, I think I might have already said that. The Black Keys already said that. Anyways, those are kind of some of the- It's interesting to hear yep. bands like, submissions. I don't think of Red Hot Chili Peppers that way. I don't think of Stone Temple Pilots that way. I don't really think of the Rolling Stones that way, I guess. <laughs> I wonder if we all have a- a I different think we all have like a different, of. I think yeah. that's why I asked the I question. Wonder, I wonder if riff rock really has more to do with the proportions of riffs to like the album content. Like how many songs are driven by a riff versus how many songs aren't? Cuz like if you put on there a ra go. rage yep. against the machine album, like yeah. da, there da, there might da, be da, like da. two songs that like aren't reliant on a pentatonic riff. Yeah. You know? It's true and I guess even a band I defend Stone Temple Pilots a ton. I think musically they're way far better than people realize, like the cuts on the records. But they do open songs with a memorable riff. Right. But and it might not be like, bonk, bonk. Right. You know? And I don't think any of, we're not yeah. saying that yeah. riff-based music is not good. No, not at all. Or that the term riff, it's just that the term riff rock doesn't feel like it encompasses enough nuance yeah it i think why we're talking about this is when i think of excellent bass playing like that's why we're always here but you go back john paul jones jimmy page playing a thing together right. it's that together you know instead of like i would never call you to riff rock you know he's yeah. an amazing bass player he's just it's just hold it down man yeah and it's a different feeling I'm sure someone said YouTube is riff rock. <laughs> they didn't, believe it or not. Somebody else did say they Royal. They probably have a song or two, sure. Definitely. Somebody uh, somebody mentioned Royal Blood, and I was like, that's definitely. Yeah. I yeah. think that's like oh, yeah. totally riff rock. Yeah. It's interesting. There's no more clarity on this answer. It's just, just curious. There is no right answer here. It's objective truth. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What's our next, uh, what's our next pedal, pedal pairing? Let's talk to oh, it. So, yeah, one thing that I put in line now is the D7 um, Ibanez delay um, echo slash echo. I don't really understand. I never had, maybe you could explain to me 
what's the difference between the echo and delay mode? Because <laughs> when I when I switch it, it's like, yeah, the <laughs> I don't hear it. So the echo is uh, it's it's a low pass filter. I'm almost positive really? one or the other is just a filter. One is I remember in the copy of this, it's like a tape emulation oh, okay. and a digital. Got it's it. a digital delay. It's a filter of some sort. I I remember going through the settings and remembering like figuring out which one I liked but I haven't played I haven't played this pedal in a while so I can't remember well, you're, anymore. today you're but playing a limited edition pink version it's beautiful too it's inspiring I love it man I went for that instead of the the gray one which yeah. is what I have and, absolutely uh, so this pedal is this is synonym there are with pedals yeah. synonymous with bands whammy rage against the machine you know uh, there's just Johnny Greenwood with his Shred Master and all that. So, I, and I think of Mute Math D7. Yeah, tell us about that. It's just yeah. I don't honestly. I don't know how it started. Maybe, maybe Greg had it on his board, but it became a part of the of the show at the end of the song, where he would, you know, put the repeat, get it get the feedback loop going mm -hmm. really crazy which this pedal does really well and then he would just turn the delay time to change the pitch of what yeah. was happening and essentially started creating like melodies and sounds with that knob so he was yeah. literally playing a the, delay yeah, yeah the delay um and i ended up getting one because for one of the songs for break the same um I can't remember what came first exactly if the if what I was doing helped the song or vice versa if the song already kind of existed but regardless the the riff for um break the same really centered around this and and just having this kind of I don't know how to describe it since it didn't have that many chord tra changes the song it just kind of get, creates this drone that you can build the low in um it was in C sharp, so the, lo the 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 low end would just kind of be swimming in C sharp, and then on the top you could put all kinds of different stuff uh, with the with the repeat down a little bit. That was like the big the big um, trick, I guess. Yeah, I could play Can a little bit of it. Yeah, demonstrate that. Um. So I would do something like. play the same riff without it now <laughs> yeah it's, it's still naked, great huh? it's still great but yeah, yeah and then it became kind of my tool to create landscape and like textures and okay. soundscapes i guess i should say soundscapes while other stuff was happening in between transitions of songs um just because the repeat is just so glorious on this thing yeah Oh. You mentioned there's even a setting if you just turn the knob. Yeah, tell us about that. It's yeah, so a that was bizarre. I think just like divine <laughs> intervention or so. I, I mean, the setting for that particular song um, was all the way down. So I always knew because it didn't have any kind of tap. Yeah. Um, with this one, I always would put the delay time to ten. Just max the knob out, and it's perfect. And for in that the song. middle range, because it has a range here, you yeah. know, the timing range. Um, it was just always right on spot, the right BPM for the song. <laughs> so that was so always awesome. my cue. I always, I always knew, just set it there, and then I could play with the repeat. The level, the delay level on this was tricky to get, you know, where I wouldn't have it cranked and it would just ruin my bass sound. But um, yeah, but yeah, it was uh, ah, just a great pedal to have well, on board. You talked about soundscapes. Let's oh, do a man. little little tribute to Brian Eno, oh, man. ambient number one music for airports ish thing i don't know they didn't have drums in any of that but nick's gonna work up a, a sick but beat. i'll add some <laughs> don't forget those uh those mic mutes y'all oh guilty josh
Very fun. I'm breaking in these. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on the top down. No. It's the Boss OD200, the MD200, and the DD200. Anyway, 
Pretty cool. So one thing I learned real quick. Yeah. Echo is better on this pedal. When <laughs> when the repeat when, when the repeat was up like that, it didn't it didn't feedback as well as the delay setting. I forgot about that. So So Echo is more restrained? Is that what you're saying? Or it lets it go more. It lets it go more. Okay. Yeah. So the del- yeah. it didn't I guess the delay side would be restrained. This gotcha. way it just kept building on itself and it is the sound that I would normally use. But I totally for- I don't know if do they all have that setting? It is I don't know. I have to look. Yeah, at the pedal. The, yeah. It's the same pedal in pink yeah, okay. or whatever color that right, is. Well. That anyway, was fun. Just so you know, I. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, that's a great sound. Really great sound. Good vibe. Let's uh, let's give your packs away. Let's do it. We have a surprise jam. We're not going to reveal. There's a special guest pedal that's going to make an appearance here. It's going to be earth shattering. <laughs> it is. There's people lined up blow, to see what we're going to do here. People's minds. Yeah, let's let's talk about the packs here. Let me pull them up. So yeah. tell us about what has gone on here. At Led- I remember we the last time I saw you, it was at a Nashville Summer Nam. I yeah. have no idea what year. It wasn't too long ago. And you had started this project, I think. Probably 17, yeah, 2017 or 2018 maybe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, trying to do what I love and just creating sounds and and um, sample fuzz audio is uh, one of those one of those things where so I'm SFA sample fuzz audio. Yeah, sample fuzz audio. Um, and I've made let's see eight packs okay. to this point. Um, the first four focus. The first one focused on this bass. So um, it's just different loops and and one shots of um, this bass through various pedals, various setups. Um, and hopefully, I, I kind of view sample packs and loops in a couple of ways. First being just a way to inspire you to write and create tracks too easily. It's kind of a jumping point, which is how I m- mostly use them uh, from different companies. Or just to build a riff or some other music around where you're actually going to use this, this sample or loop in your music. That's totally cool. Um, and then the other packs, I have an upright pack. I have um, a silver tone, a, a, a guitar pack that fo- focuses or is centered around the silver tone 1448, which is kind of like a plucky, the way I play it, plucky palm mute kind of sound uh, with different riffs, different chords, one strikes, uh, one shots of each individual um, note so people can build patches if they want and you know just be creative with them. That's my hope. Yeah. And um, I just made a fuzz one as well, which was um, I, I used the Big Muff a lot, and I use um, this Galanti guitar that I have, Italian Galanti guitar, which is just really hot pickups. It's one of my favorite guitars out there. Um, and then the new line, which you just showed a picture of, um, called the Saints Collection, focuses. It takes it. We kind of took a different turn because my good friend Jonathan Allen came on board and helped me. Um, make this um make these beats and synths and he has a great collection of synths uh we we made 808s like the big 808 classic 808 sound from scratch using analog synths uh, different effects through um a, a variety of pedals and yeah. and vintage synths as, as well um and jonathan so you guys know jonathan also played in mute math as well he's a bass bass player and multi-instrumentalist and just a great guy and so so stoked to partner up with him on on this new stuff yeah so we're gonna give away let's let's i'm gonna let's play three let's play three of these so i have uh maybe you can talk while these play and explain them this seems to be a demo of all kinds of things your different tempos different instruments put together this is made yeah so this is a demo basically of what we call the saints collection uh and it's not necessarily the saints football team it's just there's a little bit of the new orleans you know because that's where uh, a lot of my history has been and jonathan too he's from new orleans um it uh it it's four different packs it's beats which are a, a mix of organic and electronic stuff, um, a synth pack, uh, an 808 pack, and an effects pack. So okay. this demo is kind of just using the array of all that. That's 
so we're giving away the whole thing or are we doing we're doing um, a special code for yeah they could buy this like i'm it's i think it's a dollar value that we're giving away that they can buy a lot of stuff from the site um so they could get this whole pack if they wanted or if they weren't interested in this kind of production they could go and get you know base stuff yeah so here's the base This is your bass you're playing now. Yeah, through different effects. So there's a there's a folder that I did that has um, this bass through a variety of different effects. That sounds so good. Um, and then just straight stuff like you can hear that main riff right there. Phil is there having a hard time hearing me over the uh, over the music. Just that. okay. You can turn the, uh, that down on your end. Maybe Josh a little bit. How's that? Yeah. Give it a go. And then we have synth. Yeah. So yeah, just a lot of a lot of fun stuff, you know, to to create with, and hopefully inspire people. Just like what you guys are doing, inspiring people with pedals. You know, it's this sound, sounds and loops to kind of just help create your tracks and write to. Yeah, that's rad. It's been I guess a lot of fun. I guess Addison, you wanna. I got some details. Let's, let's take over the yeah. Let's take it over to Addison, who will run the giveaway train. That's it. All right. So this isn't an answer the question sort of giveaway. So don't stress out. Everybody has 24 hours to enter this giveaway. And Roy was kind enough. He's going to give us. He's going to give three different winners $200 in fuzz cash. I love that. So three fuzz lucky cash. folks get $200 awesome. each in fuzz cash. So um, follow the link. We're going to post it here. Uh, in the chat you can go follow the link it's also going to be in the description box after um, the live stream here Uh, you can follow that link you can go and you can sign up and then uh, you've got 24 hours to enter so um, until about this time tomorrow uh, we'll probably cut off the the uh, entry um, time at 3 p.m central tomorrow and if you're watching this later if you're watching it later it's probably you know you're too too late late it's It's too late thing it's the biggest mistake of your life it you really is life. you missed it so you right am i right nick pretty much yeah. is there anything worse than there's that nothing. fate nothing. no there's nothing go ahead <laughs> nothing at all <laughs> yes yeah, so i mean that's pretty much it uh i'm gonna post the details here in just a, a quick second after i quit talking because i can't multitask very well um yeah so follow the link go enter this giveaway you've got 24 hours um we'll contact you um uh, you know it asks for your email and stuff like that right. so You'll hear from so we us. have some saucy questions from Roy. You answer those. You're entered in. That's how it works. No, you don't even have to answer questions. Just, oh, no saucy questions. This is just a. This, this is, is a straight free up. game. That's it. This is so easy. It's so easy if you don't do like, it. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm going to set up. Yeah, the the special sauce. Let, let's set pedal. This, while let's, you're setting that up. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. I have I have a bone to pick with the bass community. Roy, did do you use a pick? When you play bass, absolutely. Come on, yeah. yeah. Talk so, about hey, this. I am get off so my back tired of about hearing using people a pick say don't with use bass, a pick. y'all. So That's I'll, all. I'll tell you, like yeah. the way I look at it, it's just another tool. Yeah. Like, sometimes you know the finger sounds better, and I, I would like in the middle of a song do both. Maybe for the verse, play something with like a softer thing, yeah. and then when I want to go to the chorus to amp it up, I grab the pick yeah. and get a little. Punk rock. Yeah, like even playing guitar, I do. I mean, that's yeah, just right. It's the same. Today, I've probably played less pick, but it's ironic how on a YouTube video you will get murdered for using a pick. I've I've and just I'm going, I've gotten I've gotten hate. Before. All my favorite bass players, I see them use picks anyway. Yeah, that's anyway, a good bone, so and I'm glad you. I'm just it. saying, Roy said that it's okay, so leave me alone. <laughs> Love you. Yeah, like you said, I mean, it's it's just a tool. You know? Yeah, I love it. It's a great philosophy. So we're hooking up this mystery pedal. Reminder here, this shirt, super cool, MrTambourineMan.com. That's a Morning Glory, which this ironically kind of plays in. You've been using a Morning Glory. This was not planned. Uh, it's just a really nice coincidence that this shirt was finished. We've been trying to release it, so it's available now in the merch store. Also, go follow him. Follow Go follow go him. Follow go him. follow him. I am from Alabama. I think yeah. some people do say follow. Go follow him at Mr. Tambourine Man Official on Instagram. All right, Roy. So I we need to reveal this pedal. And just as a disclaimer, we didn't really. We kind of 
picked out some progressions and almost rehearsed. This is totally off the cuff. Yeah. But this is going to be complete chaos. Not a mute math pun. So <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've played that, anybody? Yeah, One awesome. question before we go into this. I do have another question. Yeah. Um, where are we at? This is... Uh, what? Oh, no. It's this this album. Why is the vinyl to this like a like how much is it? Three hundred, five hundred dollars. Yeah, it's crazy. Man. I really want this vinyl. Um, Any plans to? What happened? I believe what's happening is, so we released this independently with a our label called Teleprompt, yeah. and I think that's the 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 release that's the that was limited and very hard to find. Apparently, it came out before vinyls were back. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably pressed like like just a few Yeah, yeah. thousand maybe or Yeah, that's something. the problem. Yeah. So I've almost paid the money for it, but I just I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah, don't. <laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to find I some won't. other way to get you one. <laughs> I won't. All right. Let's do the top down here and let's yeah, reveal so um <laughs> We got a uh, Zoom 506. Late 90s. Bass. I think it's 98. I'm not sure. Man, I really like how they, the font on that A is pretty cool. I just noticed that right now. Yeah. I like that. You had a Zoom pedal. I had, I a, had Zoom a 505. Pedal. Yeah, so. I can't remember. Maybe it was. the. Where are your Zoom pedals? Up there. It's the full collection, by the way. I, I don't want to brag. Um <laughs> It's, it was the one, the far, what number is that on the red? The, red the far one is the studio. I think it's an amp cab simulator. I think that's what I had. Yeah. Anyway, I had a blast with my Zoom pedal back in the day, and I never had one for bass. And then you had it sitting here, and I was awestruck. Well, I, I think what needs to beauty. happen is just here live. This is the only live music anyone's getting. We're just going to discover where the 506 can take us. Let's do it. As a mediocre trio that hasn't really rehearsed <laughs> with a really great bass player. Yeah. And a drummer who's really great, too. Thank you. All right, let's see. So we're a pretty good trio. <laughs> we're a pretty good trio. I'm the weakest link here. <laughs> so we're going to crank this up and see what happens. That's a great there it sound. Is. There she is. You may want to, you know, I think there's free, there's free reign to even change presets and call it, you know, we'll, we'll kill the mics a few. We can do multiple. Think of this like a yes song. Feel free okay, to swing so just it around. Scroll, just, just as go the jam progress, progresses. Yeah. Okay. Got you. All right. You know, just be a mystery, man, because I don't know what we're about to. Okay. Hit, and I'm so. going to mute my mic, Addison. Me too.
it sounds amazing. It started scro- okay. It started like scrolling by itself for me wow. right there, and I couldn't control it. I don't know what happened. That's, but- so that's from the 90s. That's the secret code. Like you're playing NBA Jam. Right, you hit right, some right. buttons, it scrolls. <laughs> My right, favorite left, left. bass tones of today are from the 506. <laughs> yes. This was a $30 pedal on Reverb. <laughs> so crazy. Get them uh, get now. Yeah, it, it just goes to show um, there's some really great bass pedals i think i think there is that let me have so much gain on i have this drive big muff down here okay yeah i my feeling historically is that bass pedals started in a way for companies to expand and sell more pedals but like as we've seen there's some really great units as time went on one specifically you really liked was the bass comp here, like this new boss. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some added. legitimately awesome bass pedals. Yeah. I think some of the first things, um, you know, do we need them? Did we need them? I don't know, but there's some really good tools now. Um, the 506. <laughs> Coming in for the win. Yeah, kind of amazing. Let's do a record time. You want to do a record time? Yeah, let's do it. So... Yeah, it's still right there. Yeah, so looking through your collection, which is great, I was really inspired and saw some stuff. First one being, I don't know where I need to show this camera right here. This camera, okay. So this was my introduction to the Beatles, thanks to my dad. He he had this exact record um, with the covering. You said this is the one that the butcher if covers. If you look covered. closely, there's a sticker over it yeah. that someone here who doesn't want to be named noticed. Um, the original cover has like, they're sitting with like chopped up baby doll parts. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was some photographer's way of being creative and it like scared a bunch of people. Yeah. So I slapped a sticker. If you have the original baby doll one, I think it's worth quite a bit. So, um, and part of the reason was that it had day tripper on it. That was like one of the first riffs that I learned and still love like you know, today, yeah. still play all the time. Um, so this is really special. If you, if you, you know, come across this, I know it's not like a revolver or rubber sole. It's like not one of those or Sergeant Peppers, but it mean, it, it means a lot to me just because of my connection with my dad. Um, it has other great songs as well. Drive my Doc, car. Dr. O- I'm only, I'm only sleeping. Yeah. Dr. Robert is Dr. amazing. Robert. Yeah. I mean, just really, really great stuff. So I wore this one out. Um, and then others that I found here that were really important to me as well were, uh, or are, um, the cure disintegration. This I've heard through a lot of like hardcore cure fans. Like this is like one of their masterpieces, if you will. Okay. Um, I can agree with that probably, you know, I mean, as a whole, it's just, ridiculous i i i was into the cure before this record came out and i felt like this was maybe a tipping point that really launched them to another place i want to say it was before kiss me kiss me kiss me uh which just like heaven was on that was a huge song for them but i think i what i what i remember hearing robert smith was a little um not too satisfied with that record and and kind of went away and made this like his opus you know it's amazing so and anyway um a yeah. lot of great great songs on this um fascination street which is the one we played earlier um possibly my favorite cure song <laughs> it's amazing that anyway m- yeah. one of mine too um and that being the case you also showed me that you had a nice single yeah kind of a bizarre um that bass line it's yeah that song is that's that's what bass can do in creating a song and even the guitar parts i was listening i was like man i just this was just so embedded into me thanks to my sister i have an older sister five years older than me and um she was my introduction into like new wave in the 80s and you know smith's cure and um anyway new order yeah so i've been listening to them for a long time and then the other one that i really love um also because the baseline baseline is so sick on it is um the sonic youth 
uh, record. Um, specifically, the song Dirty Boots, I think, is just <laughs> really, really, really great. Um, kind of around that time as well, maybe this was kind of a launching point for them um, that they, you know, that they maybe capitalized on during that grunge wave yeah. or whatever. They got lumped into that, but I'm happy for them. Happy they, they did yeah. that. Excellent records. Nick, yeah, do, you ha- do you have a favorite bass-centric artist? Like when we're talking about um, bass riffs, yeah. the driving force of bass guitar and music, what's some stuff you go to? Uh, I mean, Tame Impala always, like without a doubt. I think we all know this about me so far. Uh, also, yeah. like, there's I a, mean. There's an aspect of mute math that is inside of Tame Impala. Yes. Yeah, there, it feels I, really obvious. Yeah, I think like as far as bands that have utilized bass as like a leading melody and like really pushing the riff, like Tame Impala's done really good. I mean, Pino Palladino is like fantastic. I've never seen anybody like move so little, but play like play with like, you know what I mean? Like he just he sits there, he's so still and just like bobs his head, mm-hmm. and everything he plays is fantastic. I mean, uh. We were talking about Tower of Power, that uh, um, what is hip, that bass line. Like, I remember the first time I heard that, and I didn't know, like, bass could be so important in a song. Like, you know, yeah. and, and that song was like, yeah. holy crap. Like, that song would be nothing without that bass line. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, like, other stuff. But, like, I mean. There's a lot of not ones. so obvious. When I, I think of, and I don't know if this is Pino, but, like, Sade. What is mm-hmm. the song? Um, we played it constantly. Ordinary, that- Ordinary Love. Yeah. Like, you don't yeah. think of, you know, a lot of people won't even know what that is, but it's just like the mastery of how the bass is affecting the song, another pun. It's just how it's building. I don't know who that bass player is, but yeah. Things I like- could picture him in my head because I watch this live concert of Sade all the time, and the, the band is wearing like all these kind of like roughly like white shirts like opened up like pirate shirts like pirate that's amazing shirts. Yeah. blouses and they but they're sick i mean yeah i agree oh. with you i forgot about that about yeah. Sade stuff paul denman plays bass for okay Sade. i want to say he played yeah. like a music man a lot too i also i man. also go to like uh, asia like steely oh, dan yeah. records steely dan. like yeah for yeah. for me i think my appreciation with bass has like gone through the roof every every five years of bec- being more of an adult i think in my teen you know when you're in, I'm a guitar player you know grunge music and then as i start developing taste i just notice how magical the bass yeah without that in there music can be very boring i won't say yeah. it's not interesting but there's something i really like about that yeah radiohead too well yeah of course that's, how could you how could you forget radio yeah colin is a, is great really Vol- simple yeah Vol- Peck. With yeah. Joe Dart, yeah. Somebody pointed out in the comments they got some. Yeah, he's amazing. Some incredible yeah. bass. This was fun. I think we go over to a Q and A and we'll wrap this up. Let's let some people ask. Uh, we'll try to focus these questions to Roy specifically. I mean, we can get into some bass pedal stuff, but I'd rather just people have an opportunity to talk to uh, Roy. So here's Q and A. Three basic pedals every bass player needs. Rapid fire. Um, Baseballs. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would say uh, an overdrive of sorts, um, an EQ pedal. Nice. And an uh, octave pedal. Dope. Okay. What's your favorite distortion box? Um, Morning Glory. Hey. Really? I like it. That's amazing. Uh, you and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, do you play flats exclusively? And if so, why? No, not a, I have some other bases with round wounds, um, but I always gravitate towards um, the flats. Very I just cool. like the the warmth and like the punch to it. I felt like when I started, and and also I like the way drives and like you know distortion and fuzzes react to flat wounds okay. um, more than the round wounds. Um, and yeah, the round wounds just got a bit too. Maybe it was bright or brittle for me, you know, on bass. Yeah. I never was into that sound. So let's assume, that's... because I think this is the case, a lot of new players, young players, they may not even know what we're talking about. Could you do a quick explanation of rounds? What are we talking about? Just normally wrapped like what you think 
normal guitar strings or bass strings are. They're just wrapped around the core. Okay. And so they have these ridges, you know, and they just have, I guess, more bite and brightness to and that's them. that's a standard, that's yeah, what's that's standard that's guitar standard. string. Yeah, but if before you go that was standard, that's what you have, correct? Flats. Yeah, flats, I think, were first, which were, I think, for bass, trying to emulate upright strings, which were gut strings, I want to say, mm -hmm. for the most part, before they did steel. Um, and the flats don't have that. The way they are wrapped, um, it's, there, there are no ridges that way, and I don't know exactly what the process is on how they make them smooth. Um, but yeah, it's just a different, I wish, do we have a base here with, with yeah, rounds? Yeah, I can grab we one. We could do a little A, B. Yeah, when we chain, we changed the strings on our, uh, on our base here, and we were like, ugh, we like it when it had all the finger dirt all over it. Yeah, Because totally. it was a lot more muted and it had less of that like, metallic e attack and stuff yeah and even even more so um i like with these you know not changing them thank you i don't think i've changed those bass strings in probably like i don't know six years <laughs> that's crazy yeah that so is here cool. here's like the typical that just upset a lot of people whoa hold on a second you could, i feel like i, I don't even know if i could bypass the how do you bypass this Hit both. I think both it's at both time. at the same, or you throw it yeah. away. Okay, so there's nothing there. Typical. So the pick. Also, a lot of like know pop and slap stuff is usually done with round wounds it doesn't sound right on flats so i do have a couple of bases with uh, rounds if i need to do a track uh haven't slapped like in 10 years i think um <laughs> that's awesome the anyway, last time you changed so, your screen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. exactly. Um, so yeah, if just check out the flat sound. Yeah, that's great. I just I think there's a a lot of people who yeah I don't want to because for me I think a long time ago I would have had no clue what you were talking about. Wow, so cool. It's a different instrument. It just yeah. What happens if you slap? <laughs> you just miss, you miss a little yeah. of that, yeah, that yeah. bite, right? It's all gone. Yeah. yeah. Which is, that's I want to put slap flats is. on a few guitars. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's who, um, Greg had flats on the hollow body silver tone that me and Matthew used. Okay. Um, for I, a long time, I want to say. And, I just thought, wow, that's the tones he were he was getting, you know, the flats I think really helped. It's a different different instrument, like you said. Yeah. All right. Another question? A couple more here. Yeah. I just want to point out before we do, um, from the time that you guys started talking about the five oh six to now, they're sold out on reverb in the States. You can still yeah, buy them I'd, internationally, I'd but I tried to buy them all <laughs> earlier and the reverb was down. They're gone. Um <laughs> Uh, here's one from Fraser Lundy. Um, what's your favorite mute math bass tone, Roy? Do you have one? Um, I guess off the bat, I really am happy the way um, Obsolete came out, which was done on my upright. Very cool. Whoa. Uh, with, that's off the debut record, first record. Yeah. With a ton of pedals? <laughs> with pedals? Did you play it through pedals? No, I didn't no. actually play any pedals on that. No it was way. just straight. I had a like a normal, I think it was like a P bass style pickup on that upright, and we mic'd it maybe really? as well. I think it was just a DI. There might have been a, um, no, I think it was a DI amp and probably a, a, a mic as well. Very cool. Man, all right, last one, at least for now, um, but probably last one. Uh, how do you stay fresh with ideas as a bass player and then someone else like kind of, you know, playing off that? They said, do you ever worry about overplaying while still being creative? So... I guess talk about that, um, your style of playing and, and how you um, how you stay creative. 
I think we stay creative by just, you know, um, listening, constantly listening to new stuff and, and staying fresh to not necessarily trying to sound like anything else really, but learning from other things at the same time, if that makes sense. So like always trying to hear what people are doing and be inspired by that, you know, and whether that means going out in a walk in nature or listening to a couple of new records or old records or buying a pedal or, you know, whatever. It just, inspiration comes in so many forms. I think, I think, um, that's a big part of staying creative and exercising your creativity. I think a lot of people feel they're going to be, you know, tapped out or like they can only wrote, write so many songs a year. I think if you just work on your craft and work on, on your, your creativity kind of as a craft, it just gets better and better. That's awesome. So the people that bought the 506s just now, they took a step towards. Yes. To <laughs> towards building that creativity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really so, I can't wait to hear this. Like what's going to happen, you know? Yeah. They may be forced to reissue it. Is that it? <laughs> that was our four questions? That was it. Yeah. This has been a blast. Uh, remember the giveaway. Remember everything? We, we said a lot of stuff here. This has been really, really good. I think it's really revealing. It's been so good to have someone like you who I feel like actually knows the ins and outs you've toured so long. You've recorded so much. Yeah, it's just been great. Thanks for being on and... Thanks for having me, yeah, guys. It's been I mean, really this fun. has been a real, real treat, and yeah, it's uh, it's been amazing jamming too. It's been fun, you know, yeah. playing, playing all these bass pedals. Quotes. So, just so everyone knows, <laughs> uh, Roy is in town. We're gonna film an actual epi- an episode, a yeah. Friday episode tomorrow. It'll air weeks for I don't know when it'll air. Probably next year, even December, probably December, January. And we are you have specifically chosen uh some pedals we built out of board like your board yeah yeah we're gonna give that away on that episode later Amazing. yeah we're just we're just giving here you know it's the season of giving man it's just the season to give away base stuff this is fun um thanks so much check out the jhs uh you can go through every episode there you can do that on youtube but they're all pretty there on the site um if you look if you're looking for new music, you're in a rut. Everything ever mentioned on Record Time is also on the website. It's a lot of music. Uh, and also merch. Um, all kinds of shirts and things you absolutely don't need. You don't need any of this. Really, it'd be better if you didn't buy it, honestly. But it's there. And uh, also... We have the Patreon, which is where I do long-form talks. Kind of think of it as online college of guitar and pedal history. Things like researching the history of Ross pedals, custom amplification. This is really nerdy stuff. Um, we do a lot of giveaways as well. Things that are pretty wild over there. Yeah, like an unopened Toadies record. You're not going to get that anywhere else. This talk, uh, scrolling back down how to collect pedals that might seem boring. It's actually very interesting. It's like my process of insanity of how to approach, like what are you going after, how to collect all kinds of things, how the show started. We've done, um, film things in London about Denmark street. We've tons and tons of episodes and kind of deep dives. This is for people that are really interested in story and narrative and how the guitar world kind of formed over the decades. And if you're a member of that, it helps support uh, our travel, our documentary work, all the research, the staff. I mean, to do the show, it's about four people. Um, so it's a lot of work doing this. And that that's a huge piece of that. So please go check that out if you want. That's everything. Are we done here? Are we done, Nick? I think so. I think the crowd's think, excited. And, I think so. Yeah. All right. Signing off. Thanks so much. Thanks again, Roy. Thank you. All right.